And let's pray first. Father, you, you made your word come to the prophet Zechariah, and he saw it. And Lord, we pray now that you do the same for us and make this wonderful word come to us so that we can see, especially our Lord Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Zechariah chapter 3. It's 10 verses here. Zechariah 3, 1. He showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. And the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan, even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem to rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel. And he answered and spake unto those that stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And unto him he said, Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with change of raiment. And I said, Let them set a fair mitre upon his head. So they set a fair mitre upon his head and clothed them with garments. And the angel of the Lord stood by, and the angel of the Lord protested unto Joshua, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, If thou wilt walk in my ways, if thou wilt keep my charge, then thou shalt also judge my house and shalt keep my courts, and I will give thee places to walk among these to stand by. Hear now, O Joshua the high priest, thou and thy fellows that sit before thee, for they are men wondered at. For behold, I will bring forth my servant the branch. For behold, the stone that I have laid before Joshua upon one stone shall be seven eyes. Behold, I will grave, engrave the graving thereof, saith the Lord of hosts. And I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. And that day, saith the Lord of hosts, shall you call every man his neighbor under the vine and under this fig tree. So, so far we've seen in these first two chapters of Zechariah a very typical pattern that we see in the Bible. And it's a pattern that's described in Romans 5.20. Romans 5.20 where it says, Where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. The sin of Israel was getting worse and worse. They were going into more and more idolatry. And as that was happening, God was stepping out more and more in this wonderful display of mercy and grace. And that's what we're going to see now also in this, in this chapter, uh, chapter 3. The chapter opens with a man named Joshua, who is the high priest. And what a scene this is that's revealed in, in verse 1, where we see that that God showed to Zechariah, Joshua the high priest. He was standing there before the angel of the Lord, and Satan was standing on the right hand of Joshua. Joshua is standing there before the angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord is a common title that's used for God the Son, for Jehovah Jesus. He is one member of the Godhead that was chosen to be that member of the Godhead who would serve the role of God to man. In Mark 10, 45, Mark 10, 45, he said, even the Son of Man, speaking of himself, even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, to give his life a, a, a ransom for many. He was the minister to man. And that's what angels do, as it says in, Ro in uh, Hebrews, Hebrews 1, 13, Hebrews 1, 13. To which of the angels said he at any time, thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Sit, sorry, sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? So the Bible in this place is calling Jehovah Jesus the angel of the Lord. Why? Because he's the Lord of the angels. He's the Lord of the angels. And we see that Joshua is standing before him. He's standing before him. It says he's standing before. And that always means in the Bible, standing before. He's got to give an account. He's got to give a report of his life. He's in the state of accountability. He's under the inspection of, of Jehovah Jesus. Because it says in Romans 14.10 about us. In Romans 14.10 it says we're going to be in the same place. It says we shall all stand. Romans Romans 14.10, we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. There's not one person that's going to escape being held accountable in judgment. It says in Revelation 20.12, Revelation 20.12, I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were open. And another book was open, which is the book of life. 
And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. So at the judgment, it's a terrible thought. Books are going to be open. Terrible, terrible books that have recorded everything. There's a recording going on. We are under the heavenly re recording of a video that's keeping a record of everything we think and we say and we do. And that's the basis for a judgment. But thank God in, Ro in, in Revelation 20.12, that verse, Revelation 20.12, thank God that another book was opened, which is the book of life. And every person in this life has a choice of whether they want to be judged out of the book of the works of their lives, which is, or whether they want to be judged out of the book of the works of Christ. In other words, which one do they want to have count for them? Because, because how ironic it is that Christ himself is the person who's, who who has been given the authority and the power to judge every person. As he says in, in, in John 5.22, John 5.22, the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. And Romans 5.27, Romans 5.27, I'm sorry, John. John 5.27, John 5.27, Jesus said that he's been given, that he's been given authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. When he prayed to the Father in the, in, the, in the high priestly prayer of John 17, John 17, 2, he said, Thou, he said, Jesus said to the Father, Thou hast given him power over all flesh, so that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. So we see this. We see Joshua the high priest. He's standing before Jehovah Jesus to give an account. And then the field of vision is open to us. And then we see not only him standing there before Jehovah Jesus' judgment, we see another person. This person is Satan. And he's standing right on the right hand in verse 1. Verse one. S Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. So there's Joshua the high priest, and right on his right hand there is Satan with one goal. Resist. Resist him. How does he resist him? He re how does he resist us? He resists by accusing. He is the accuser. He's standing, that's the way it was in court in those days. That when a prisoner, when, an, when, a, when a person who has been indicted is standing in court, on his right hand would come the accuser and would accuse her there. And that's what we see Satan doing there. Satan in Hebrew means adversary, opponent. That's what it means. So Satan is being a Satan to Joshua the high priest. He's opposing. Revelation 12 to 10. Revelation 12 10 says that. that the accuser of our brethren, which accused them before God day and night. He's cast out. That's Satan. He's accusing. He doesn't sleep. He accuses day and night. And the fact that he's at the, the right hand of Joshua is significant. Why? Because the right hand is the hand of action. That's the hand that's used for action. So when he's trying to work for God, when he's trying to do something for God, Satan there is is resisting him from doing that. And what are we to do when Satan resists us? Exactly the same thing. We are to resist, as it says in James 4, 7, James 4, 7. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. And this is what we see the Lord Jesus do when, 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 when Satan, speaking through Peter, his own disciple, was, 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 was telling him, don't go to the cross don't go to the cross, Lord. Don't go to the cross. Pity yourself. And, 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 uh, and the Lord Jesus resisted what it says in Matthew 16, 23. Matthew 16, 23. He turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou art an offense unto me. For thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. So the Lord Jesus, he doesn't converse with Satan. He just resists him with a get thee behind me, Satan. And this is what we see the Lord Jesus doing here, Jehovah Jesus doing in verse 2. In verse 2, the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan, even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? Now on first glance, we, we, in verse 2, we would say, Who is talking? Who is talking? We can't get it right because we look at this, it says, The Lord said unto Satan. And who is being referred to? When it says then, the Lord rebuke thee. 
You know, clearly, that second Lord is not the same person as the first Lord. First Lord. It would be like the same thing, as, like, like if Frank is rebuking Sam, then it would be a statement like, Frank said, Frank rebuke you, Sam. That doesn't make any sense. If Frank is rebuking Sam, then it would read, Frank said, I rebuke you, Sam. That's the way it would read. But the first Lord in verse 2 is saying that he is, he, he is, he is, he is he's, he's, he's resisting and he's rebuking. And then if the first Lord was doing that rebuking, then it would say, then he would say something like he said in Revelation 3.19, Revelation 3.19, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. The first Lord referred to it as the Lord said unto Satan, those two Lords are different persons. Those two Lords, are, it's the Lord rebuke thee, O Satan, is different from the first Lord who said. The first Lord who spoke directly to Satan was God the Son, is the Lord Jesus. The second Lord who rebuked Satan was God the Father. So this is, a, this is an example of seeing in the Old Testament another place where, the, where, where, where the God is a Godhead made up of different persons, just like David said in Psalm 110, Psalm 110, verse 1, Psalm 110, verse 1, when he said, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. David was the king of Israel. He was the top man. He had no human Lord. So when David said that the Lord said unto my Lord, the Lord said unto David's Lord, that was God the Father saying to God the Son that he, would, that he should sit at the right hand until his enemies be made his footstool. Just another example in the Old Testament of how there's more than one person in the Godhead. So here's Joshua the high priest. He's accused. There's Satan at his right hand accusing him to resist him. And what is Joshua to do when he's being accused by Satan of the right hand? He knows that what Satan is saying is true. And when Satan accuses you, he speaks truth. He's got a lot of material to work with when he wants to pull up our sins. What, what we thought, what we said, what we did. He's got a lot to work with, and he works with it by way of accusation. And this is when Joshua the high priest hears the most wonderful words that he could hear in verse 2. When he hears the Lord say to Satan, the Lord rebuke thee, O Satan. Those are the most wonderful words that could be said in our defense. When we're accused of what we know we're guilty of, we, when we're accused of that, when we hear that the judge is our friend, he's our friend. I remember one time when, when, uh, when Ellie Maxwell, who founded uh, Prairie Bible Institute up in, you know, in Canada, and a person came to him and said just horrible things to his face, accused him of terrible things. And Ellie Maxwell just responded. And he said, he said, rather than to fight back, Ellie Maxwell just said to that man, I want you to know that right in between you and me right now is the Lord Jesus Christ. And what you said to me, you just said to him. It's wonderful to rest in that. We have an advocate. We have a person fighting for us. And so Joshua the high priest was very wise to just, to just wait. And God rebuked the devil. And his rebuke was, in verse 2, the Lord hath chosen, the Lord hath had chosen Jerusalem. Satan was not just accusing Joshua the high priest. Joshua was the high priest. He was accusing Israel. He was accusing the Jewish people. He had his gun set for higher marks than just one man. Joshua the high priest. He was accusing the Jews. And, and, when, and, and that's why the response was so significant when it says, the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem, rebuke thee, rebuke thee. The Lord chose in Romans 9.16. Romans 9.16, it speaks about this choice that God made of Israel. Romans 9.16, it's not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. The Jews will be saved, not because of, their, because of the Jews, not of him that runneth. The Jews will be saved, because, not because of us, not because of us, not of him that willeth. The Jews will be saved only because of God, but of, because of God who showeth mercy. And there's only one reason why one day, when all the Jewish people that are alive at that time 
that it, when the, after two-thirds of them are, uh, don't survive. At that time, there's only one reason why all of them will be saved at that time, and it's because of God. It's because of God. The Jews that will be saved will not be because of these people who are going around starting Monday to visit all the Jews that they can distribute gospel literature. It's going to be because of God who chose them. And they're the instruments. They're the instruments that God prayerfully is going to use to bring, make that happen. And so, and so the question is, with all the sin that Israel went into, the idolatry, we're in the middle of it here in the book of Zechariah, and the turning over of their Messiah to the Romans to kill him, would God still have chosen them if he knew all of that? If he knew the worst of them, would he have chosen them? Just like the question, if he knew the worst of you, of everything that you would do in your life, will he still have chosen you? And it says in Romans 11.1, 1, Romans 11.1, 1, I say then, has God cast away his people? God forbid. I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not cast away his people. And here come the words, which he foreknew. He did not cast away his people, which he foreknew. God saw the whole history of the Jews before he, tra- he, before he chose them. He saw it all. He saw that his blood be upon us and on our children. He saw the, let him be crucified. He saw the, we want Barabbas, not the, he saw it all. He saw the golden calf. He saw everything about them. That was what's meant by which he foreknew, which he foreknew. He knew, God knew what he was getting into when he chose Jerusalem, when he chose the Jewish people. God knew what he was getting into when he chose you. And knowing all that, God stands by his choice. And that's the beauty of what it says here. The Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke you, O Satan. He knew the worst of them when he chose them, and he still stood by to choose. And then Joshua hears how God refers to him. He said in verse 2, he says, God, he, said, he says to Satan, this man you're accusing here, Joshua high priest, this nation of Israel, the Jewish people who he represents, who are standing behind him, who you're accusing, he said, is not this, in verse 2, is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? That's the description of every saved person. Every saved person who's going right down the middle of the road to hell. And God reaches down and saves that person from hell. He's a brand plucked out of the fire. You know, a brand plucked out of the fire is not a very praiseworthy thing, a brand plucked out of the fire. To be a brand plucked out of the fire does not mean that the brand should be praised, or, or the, but it means that the one who plucked them out of the fire should be praised. Because a brand plucked out of the fire is covered with soot and it's, covered, it's smoky and it's dirty and it's got the smell of smoke on it. And that's how Joshua, the high priest, rep- was and represented Jerusalem, represented the Jewish people. All dirty, all filthy. Joshua, the high priest, became, the point is, he became cleansed. He, begot a, he got a change of clothing. He was set apart like every saved person is. Every saved person 1 Corinthians 6, 9. 1 Corinthians 6, 9. Know you not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you are washed, you are sanctified, you are justified, in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of God, of our God. You were a brand plucked out of the fire. We were in ourselves, Isaiah 64, 6. Isaiah 64, 6. That's how we were. We are all as an unclean thing. And all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. And we all do fade as a leaf. And our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. That's us. That's us. There was, but, but now there is a washing, there is a justification, there is a sanctification, like Joshua, the high priest we see here. But in and of himself, Joshua was in a state of, verse 3, verse 3, Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel. Filthy garments, 
Those would be the filthy garments that make a people feel guilty. Those would be the filthy garments that make a person feel dirty inside. And those two problems of being guilty for sins committed, of feeling dirty inside, are the very two problems that the Lord Jesus came to take away, the guilt and the defilement. And all we have to do now, confess our sins to the Lord Jesus, and then be finished with the guilt, with the defilement. That's all we've got to do. 1 John 1.9, 1 John 1.9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We do not have a righteousness in ourselves. All of our righteousnesses, the best we can do, is described as nothing better than filthy rags. But thank God, thank God how he has made the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ to become our righteousness. Chashab, such a beautiful word in, 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 that it means in, in, in Hebrew. Chashab, it means weaving. It's the word that was used for Betzalel and, and Aholiab when they made the curtains for the tabernacle, beautiful curtains on Egyptian white linen and the cherubs that were built, put in there, the blue, the purple, and the scarlet. And it, and it says they hashabed, they wove them in so that when you looked at those curtains, they were just a part of the curtains. They woven in uh, the tapestry, woven in of the cherubims. They were just a part of the curtain. And that's the word that God used when he said about Abraham in, in Genesis 15. He says, God imputed unto him righteousness. He believed God, Abraham believed God, and God imputed to him righteousness. He hachshabed. God hachshabed. He wove the righteousness of Jehovah Jesus into the fabric of, of Abraham's soul. And this, is why, and this is what God does for us. He said in, in, in 1 Corinthians 1.30, 1 Corinthians 1.30, but of him are you in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom, righteousness, and sanctification and, redemp and redemption. That verse is saying that God takes us when we come to Christ and he weaves into the fabric of our soul. Christ has made unto us righteousness and sanctification. After King David, after he sinned horrible sins in his affair with, um, with Bathsheba and his murder of her husband, and he knew he needed to be cleansed from his sin, he knew, he, 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 he knew who to turn to when he needed this cleansing. And he says in Psalm 51, 2, Psalm 51, 2, wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. And at that moment, as a, as, as a matter of fact, that's what makes a person a child of God. When God does those two things for the person, saves him from his sins, cleanses him from his, sin, his sins, that's what makes a person a child of God. And, God, and that's what makes a person a child of God, and that's what makes God his God. And this is why I said, Ezekiel 37, 23. Ezekiel 37, 23. Neither shall they defile themselves any more with their idols, nor with their detestable things, nor with any of their transgressions. But I will save them out of all their dwelling places wherein they have sinned, and I will cleanse them so that they shall be my people and I will be their God. And this is what Israel has not known ever since they turned their Messiah over to the Romans to destroy him. But the day of reversal is fast coming. And that reversal will mean that a fountain will be open to them, which right now they have made it closed to themselves. But it's gonna, it says in Zechariah 13.1, in Zechariah 13.1, in that day shall there be a fountain open to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness. Just like the hymn says, there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunged beneath that blood lose all their guilty stains. That fountain is from the old rugged cross, a fountain that was open to the Gentiles 2,000 years ago. That fountain was closed because they closed it themselves to the Jewish people, but it's going to be open for the most part for the Jews, and it'll be for them as it has been for the Gentiles for 2,000 years. 
that Zechariah 13, 1, fountain opened for sin and uncleanness. Now, the next wonderful command that Joshua the high priest hears is in verse 4, which is, take away the filthy garments from him. God couldn't stand to look at it any longer. He says, get rid of them. And just think of Joshua. He's standing there in clothes that he knows are filthy in God's sight. And what's Joshua going to do? He doesn't have any other clothes to put on. He doesn't have anything else to put on. He knew that the high priest was to be clothed in clean clothes. That was an imperative that Moses had to make for the priest clean clothes in Exodus 28.2. Exodus 28.2. Thou shalt make holy garments for Aaron thy brother, for glory and for beauty. Exodus 28.42. Exodus 28.42. Thou shalt make them linen breeches to cover their nakedness from their loins, even unto their thighs shall they reach. And the priests were commanded in Isaiah 52.11, Isaiah 52.11, be ye clean that bear the vessels of the Lord. So what's he supposed to do? What's Joshua, the high priest, supposed to do? He's clothed in filthy garments, but how happy he is when he hears God say, get rid of those filthy garments. Take those, he told an angel, take those filthy garments away and off of him. That they should be taken from him, just like with Adam and Eve after they sinned and they clothed themselves in, in fig leaves. And God looked at those fig leaves and said, Get rid of those fig leaves. Get rid of those fig leaves. As it says in Genesis 3 7, Genesis 3 7, the eyes of them were both open and they knew they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. In Genesis 3 21, Genesis 3 21. Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. So instead of those filthy garments of those personal sins, God says in verse 4 of Zechariah 3, 4, Zechariah 3, 4, Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee. Just as they were taken, just as those, those, those filthy garments were passed from Joshua. Oh, so glad to be rid of those. He says in verse 4 of Zechariah 3, Zechariah 3, 4, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with the change of raiment. I'm not going to leave you there naked. God said, I have caused that iniquity to pass from thee. Such a statement, such a statement of God's personal involvement. He didn't say, I assign this angel that this person's iniquity should pass from him. That was the first description of the Lord Jesus by John the Baptist. John the Baptist and John 129, John 129. The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. He takes away the sin of the world. An angel didn't take away the sin of the world. The Lord Jesus takes it away, passes it from, pass those filthy garments off of you. The Lord Jesus is the Lamb of God, and he himself personally takes on, takes away the sin of the world. He takes away the sin of the world. Just like in John 1.29, when John the Baptist saw him, in essence, John the Baptist was saying, there he is, there he is. He's the Lamb of God himself. He alone is going to take away the sin of the world all by himself, personally. He's going to remove the sin of the world. He's going to remove the sin from you. He's going to take it away personally. And this is the spirit of what uh, Jehovah Jesus is saying here in Zechariah 3, 4, in verse 4, Zechariah 3, 4. Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee. Personally, intimately. This is what it means in, in Revelation 1, 5. Revelation 1, 5, where it says, Jesus Christ, unto him who loved us and washed us from our sins, in his own blood. Washed us from our sins in his own blood. How personal. His own blood. How intimate. His own blood. It says, Hosea 13, 44. Hosea 13, sorry, 14. Hosea 13, 14. Hosea 13, 14 says, I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. O death, I will be thy plagues. O grave, I will be thy destruction. All those I wills, four of them in that Hosea 13, 14. And not once is the, the he will. Not once. But it's all, I will ransom, I will redeem, 
I will be the plague of death. I will be the destruction of the grave. Isaiah 25, 8. Isaiah 25, 8. He will swallow up death in victory. That's pretty close. Swallow? Not taste. He did taste death for every man. But he's going to swallow up death. He tastes it in his mouth, and then it keeps going, and he swallows it. He will swallow up death in victory, and the Lord will wipe away tears from all faces. Uh, Isaiah 25, 8. Isaiah 25, 8. And the rebuke of his people shall he take away from off of the earth, for the Lord hath spoken it. The Lord himself will taste him, and he'll swallow up death in victory. And it was hard. It was hard for him to take that cup and taste it and swallow it. As he said in Matthew 26, 39, Matthew 26, 39, he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thy wilt. Death was in that cup. That was death. And he tasted it. And then he kept on, he kept on in his mouth till he drank it all up. He swallowed up death and victory. Isaiah 25, 8. He himself, therefore, he's going to wipe tears away from all faces. That's why he did it. He, he's not going to say to an angel, get a Kleenex and clean up the, the tears. He, he himself is going to wipe away the tears. He himself is going to take the rebukes just like he did in, in, in this chapter we're in, in, with Joshua, the high priest. The high priest. Because it says in Hebrews 2.14, Hebrews 2.14, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. There's all these personal statements, all these intimate statements. He himself, partaker of flesh and blood, he might destroy the devil, he might deliver them. He speaks in, in Isaiah 43, 25, Isaiah 43, 25, and he says, I, even I, am he that blotteth out thy transgressions for mine own sake and will not remember thy sins. It's another statement of personal, intimate involvement. He says, I, even I, am he that blotteth out thy tra transgressions. It's like, it's like he says, it's like people were saying, who, even who? And he says, I, even I. And, 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 and we can see him just taking this joy himself as he blots out transgressions. He erases it from those books of the works that are used in judgment. And we're going to talk about Revelation 20. And so that when a saved person comes to that final judgment and the books are open to see his sins, all they can see is eraser marks. That's all they see. All they have, that's all been blotted out. Or maybe there's just a little bit of blood there. It's the blood of Christ that's used to, to erase and remove all those sins. And, and, and the way this verse reads, is, it says in verse 4, Zechariah 3, 4, verse 4, Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee. Pass from thee, not just pass away from thee, not just, but, but those, the, 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 not just that sins are just removed, but specifically they are passed from thee, and that raises the next question. Pass from thee to where? Pass from thee to who? And the answer to that question is Isaiah 53, 4. Isaiah 53, 4. Surely, just picture the sins being passed. They passed from him. And where are they going to? Isaiah 53, 4. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted, but he was wounded for our transgressions, and he was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. As just the, the hymn puts it so well. And all our sins, and all our sins, and all our sins were laid on him. All our iniquities were passed from us unto him. That's how he bore them. That's how he was judged for them. It was all instead of us. Instead of us. He was the instead of Savior, instead of us Savior. And Genesis 22.13 is where that, that concept was first introduced in Genesis 22.13. Abraham has taken his son, has taken his son on a three-day journey, taken his son on a three-day journey with a broken heart, knowing all along 
His son is the sacrifice. The son goes along until he realizes halfway up the hill of Moriah, he says, here's the fire, Father, Isaac says to him. Isaac, Abraham's son, says to Abraham, the father, Father, here's the fire, here's the wood, here's the knife. Are we missing something? Did you forget the lamb? Where's the lamb, Father? Abraham knows it's Isaac. He says, my son, God will provide. God will provide. He's already told the people down below when he left for that last trip up to Mount Moriah. We're going to go there and worship. We will return. Isaac and me will return. He has total confidence. Killed, my son. Burned up to ashes, my son. No problem for the God who said that this son's going to make a nation. And he's got confidence. But still, he has to deal with the anxiety with the, with the telling the truth to his son. And so he, he, he uh, Genesis 22, 13, Genesis 22, 13. Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. Abraham wo- went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. The Lord Jesus is the great in the stead of lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. First was this taking away of the filthy garments from Joshua the high priest in verse 4. Then there was the passing of the iniquity from the sinner to the Lord Jesus in in, in verse 4. And now comes the clothing. The clothing, uh, just as personal, just as intimate as the taking away of the sins, as the the becoming the landing point for the sins. But it says in verse 4, verse 4, Zechariah 3, 4, I will clothe thee with change of raiment. Continuation of the whole history of Adam and Eve. Genesis, whole history of Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve made themselves aprons in Genesis 3, 7. They made themselves those ridiculous fig leaf aprons. It's the best they could do. It was pathetic. Gen- verse 21, it's a, verse 21, Genesis 3, 21. Genesis 3, 21. Adam also to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothed them. Two very important steps there. Two very important steps. God made those coats of skin. Nothing could stop God from making those uh, those coats of skin. Nothing could stop God from making them. God decided to do that, and he immediately made better clothing for them. That's what he did. God didn't need any cooperation from Adam and Eve in order to make those coats of skin. That was totally God's decision, and God did it. But number two in that verse, in Genesis 3.21, Genesis 3.21, God clothed them. Oh, wait a minute. God clothed them? That involved the decision of Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve could have said, get those things away from me. Get those bloody skins away from me. I like my fig leaves better, as Cain did. I like my offering of vegetables better than a blood offering. They could have done that. They could have followed along in in what their their firstborn son would, would do. They could have refused to let God clothe them. And God did not force Adam and Eve to clothe them. God didn't say, now you hold still, I'm going to put these clothes on you whether you like it or not. No, no, that's not God. They they, they were going to be clothed with those coats of skins only if they chose to let God clothe them. Only if they submitted to the choice that God had. They had to submit and let God clothe them. They could have refused, just like people today. Christ died for their sins. That was Christ's decision. No one could stop that. That's what happened. Christ died for the sins of man, and man could not stop Christ from dying for his sins. But whether or not a person wants to be saved from his sins, that's up to the individual alone. Man can refuse, and God gives him the ability to refuse. God crowns him with the sovereignty of choice, and sadly, many do refuse. Like that Somali yesterday who told me, uh, he, he said, if we both died, I was in the lift uh, track, road with him. He said, if we both died, I said, do you mean me right now, if we have an accident, we both die? He goes, yeah, just like that, he says, if we both die. He says, right now, he says, uh, he says uh, I am not going to receive Jesus, he said, and if I have to receive Jesus, then I'll be burning in hell, he said. Then he said the opposite thing about Allah, which is not worth repeating. So, so like Joshua, the high priest, he has to be clothed. He has to be clothed. Like Adam and Eve, they had to be clothed. Like it says in Genesis, uh, Galatians, Galatians 3.27, Galatians 3.27. As many of you as has been baptized into Christ have 
put on Christ. They put on Christ. Job knew it. Job knew it in Job 29.14. Job 29.14, Job said, I put on righteousness. He had already said that he, he, he was a sinner repenting in, in, in dust and ashes. He already said that. He's already said that he was unclean. But he says in Job 29.14, I put on righteousness. And we're commanded in Galatians 3.27, put on Christ. And Isaiah knew it. And Isaiah rejoiced with these new clothes that he had from Jehovah Jesus. He was so happy in Isaiah 61.10, Isaiah 61.10, I will re greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness. So, oh, it's just like the father of the prodigal son. The product, when the father of the prodigal son saw his son, he in essence says, take those filthy garments off my son and put a new cloth on him, uh, clothing on him in, in Luke 15, 22. Luke 15, 22. The father said to his servants, bring forth the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand, shoes on his feet. That's why we're commanded also in Romans 13, 14, Romans 13, 14, put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Joshua, he was, Joshua the high priest, Joshua the high priest, he was standing there, he had no clothes. He had no clothes, but God did. And this is what God told the church of Laodicea in Revelation 3.18, Revelation 3.18. I counsel thee, he tells the church, buy of me gold tried in the fire, thou mayest be rich, and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. Do not appear. Revelation 19.7, Revelation 19.7 says, Let us be glad, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage supper of the Lamb has come, and his wife hath made herself ready, and to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. The righteousness of the saints. Not their righteousness, Christ's righteousness made unto the Christ, made unto them righteousness. So Joshua, the high priest, is clothed in verse 5. In verse 5. And, and, and then, and I said, let them set a fair mitre had on, his, on his head. And they set a fair mitre upon his head and clothed him with garments. And the angel of the Lord stood by. What's on that mitre? What was on that mitre? What was on that hat that he wore? What was on there was Exodus 39.30. Exodus 39.30. Moses was told. And they made the plate of the holy crown of pure gold and wrote upon it a writing like the engravings of a signet, Holiness to the Lord. And they tied it with a lace of blue and fastened it on high upon the mitre as the Lord commanded Moses. The high priest, the high priest wore a sign on his hat. He wore a sign on his hat and it said, Holiness to the Lord. And what that said was, Holiness is from the Lord. What that said was, all righteousness is from God. My righteousness is not my own. I'm wearing God's righteousness. What would it be like if you had a sign on your hat and, it just, and you walked around every day and it just said, my righteousness comes from God? What would that be like? That's what it was like for the high priest. That's the like they put that. And then comes this all-important statement in verse 5. Verse 5, the, the angel of the Lord stood by. Can't you see it? All this is going on. Jehovah Jesus is standing by. He didn't leave Joshua the high priest. It's a phrase we can cling to. When we're lonely, the angel of the Lord stands by. When we're hurting, the angel of the Lord, Christ himself, stands by. When we're rejoicing, the angel of the Lord stands by. All because Hebrews 13.5, Hebrews 13.5, he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. And then God says how all this is possible how can all this be? Verse 8, verse 8. Hear now, Joshua the high priest, thou and thy fellows that sit before thee, for they are men wondered at. Behold, I will bring forth my servant, the branch. The branch. Joshua is in danger of losing his position as high priest because of his sin. But then God comes back in verse 8 and says, And now hear this, O Joshua the high priest. That's a reinstatement of Joshua, a happy that Joshua should be so happy. Joshua, the communication has been restored between you and heaven. 
because, of, because you, you've been forgiven, you've been cleansed. And, 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 and that, you say, well, oh, that good for Joshua? No, good for us, because we are priests. 1 Peter 2.9, 1 Peter 2.9, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And, go, and, and what is our role? What is our role in all this as high priests, as priests, as priests? 2 Corinthians 5.18, 2 Corinthians 5.16. All things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and given us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, to, to say, we're supposed to say this, God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us this word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you, beg, beseech you by us, be, we pray you in Christ's stead, be reconciled to God. So when we, as God's priests, preach the gospel we, and reconcile men to God, that's something that people look at, they wonder at. And, that's, and, and what's our message? What's our message? It's verse 8. It's verse 8. Behold, God said, behold, I'll bring forth my servant, the branch. The branch. That's a favorite term. That's a favorite term in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah. You'll find that over and over again. The the prophet Isaiah refers to Jehovah Jesus as the branch, the branch, like in Isaiah 53. He appears, the branch appears, and then grows. In Isaiah 53, 2, Isaiah 53, 2. He shall grow up before him as a tender plant and a root out of a dry ground. And then the branch produces fruit. What's this, what, what's fruit? As an outgrowth like a branch from the main stalk. That's the Lord. In, in Isaiah 4.2, Isaiah 4.2, In that day shall the branch of the Lord be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the earth shall be excellent and comely for them that are escaped of Israel. He's beautiful. The, the, the branch is beautiful. John 1.14, John 1.14, he's called the Word. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld the glory, his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. He's glorious. He's glorious. And when he was transfigured on that Mount of Transfiguration in Mark 9.3, in Mark 9.3, it says his raiment became shining, exceeding white as snow. It's a, he speaks about his glory in, in John 17.5. When he prays to his Father, he prays, he says, uh, and now John 17.5, And now, O Father, glorify me with thine own self with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. And he brings forth fruit. The branch grows out, and then comes the fruit. And the fruit is Hebrews 2.10. Hebrews 2.10. It became him for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. And then he's excellent. He's excellent. He's, he's excellent. Hebrews 1.4. Hebrews 1.4. Being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by an inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. And then he's comely, or beautiful, for them that are escaped out of Israel. 1 Peter 2.7, 1 Peter 2.7 says this, Unto you therefore which believe, he's precious. And he is, all, he is for all of us because he said, he, he's beautiful for us. Why is he beautiful for us? Because he said, verse 9, verse 9, I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. He says, one day. One day. What was that day? That was the day of Matthew 27, 51. Matthew 27, 51. Behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. The earth did quake and the rocks rent. One day. Uh, Daniel saw that one day in Daniel 9, 24. Daniel 9, 24 when he said, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness. One day, 2,000 years ago, God removed iniquity when all our sins, all our sins, all our sins were laid on him. He was wounded for our transgressions. And this leaves us 
with the response of the hymn, I'll live for him who died for me. How happy then my life will be. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the branch. In Jesus' name, amen.